Hello, World Geography students. This is the introduction to maps review for World Geography. So first, before we get into maps and mapping, let's talk about why it's important to learn basic mapping skills. Well, first, maps display useful and in-depth information. They're really important to look at when determining where to go, why you want to go to some place, when to go. You can examine trade, you can look at allergies in a specific location, where to invest. There's a lot of different important information. In addition, maps allow you to know location, relative and absolute location. You can see where Colorado is in relation to Florida. You can see where Russia is in comparison to Germany. You can also look at absolute location using the coordinates and the grid system with zero degrees latitude and 20 degrees longitude or um, 23 and a half degrees north by 120 west. You can punch those into Google and you can look, oh my gosh, that takes me to one specific place. Maps also help individuals understand the world in a simple way. So if I have a special purpose map, I can look at where life expectancy is in China in comparison to Taiwan without looking at a very long table of information. And if you're familiar with different types of mapping tools, like scale, key, compass, title, then you are effectively able to read and analyze a map. Now, a map like this, it's pretty. You can have it on the background of your computer, you can have it as a design, but it doesn't really reveal much information. It doesn't reveal any political boundaries, any elevation, it doesn't show me the name of any country or the scale or distance. So those are some things that we are gonna review right now. The first thing that we're gonna review is the political map. Now, hopefully you can tell with this map, the color changes and that's what's really key. North America is orange, South America is green. Europe is green, Asia is yellow, Africa is orange, and you see Australia is this red type of color, Antarctica is white. So you have here the seven different continents and they have different colors with the borders. You can see this border here. The different uh, colors indicate a different border. So what is the definition? These political maps show clear borders between countries, states, cities, counties, etc. There are a lot of different types of political maps, depending on if you're looking at a wide view of the world, like the map I just showed you with the different continents, or a closer up look with different cities or counties or states labeled. But they show specific boundaries, mainly because the color is changing. Now this is helpful when you need to distinguish clear political lines. If you don't see these clear political lines, you might start a war. Not cool. Politicians definitely need these political maps. You can see here on this political map, Egypt is one specific color. Libya is one specific color. Niger is one specific color, Chad is a color, and the same colors don't touch the same political boundary. And that's something incredibly important when you create your own political maps. Make sure that Afghanistan is purple and Pakistan is not purple because there is a clear border between these two countries. Next is physical maps. This shows the physical features of an area and details include mountain, ranger, mountain ranges, valleys, deserts. Again, this is similar to the political map I showed you with it focusing on the continents, but depending on the size and scale of the map that you're looking at, you can see lakes, rivers, small tributaries, you can see creeks, you can see the name of different mountain peaks. So this is going to examine a lot of different topography and if it's, again, a really close map, you can see it in a very, very specific way. So if you're coloring a physical map, you need to make sure that you change the color most often when you're changing elevation. Here, you can see the Sahara Desert. Here, you can see the Central African Rainforest. Here, you can see the Himalayan Mountain Range. Here, you can see the Andes, all because of the different topography uh, and, and scale changing. So notice how this color is changing with the land changing. Now the next map that we're going to go over is the special purpose map. 
Now, special purpose map shows specific information. There's a ton of different types of special purpose maps that you can create or that you can find. This is one that I created using information from the World Bank database and it's of Asia. Uh, different examples of local maps, they could show natural resources, cultural concepts, like uh, the main religion in a country or the official language, uh, political affiliation, movement of people, trade. Um, again, I mentioned this earlier, you can look at where allergies are prevalent in specific months. If you're looking to travel, you can look at um, typical weather in specific months so you know where to travel. So it's really helpful because it helps you analyze geographic data on a map. And if you're incredibly visual, you don't have to look at a long table of information. You can see this in a visual way. Now, if you have a special purpose map, it's really important that you have specific tools on this map. Because if you don't have these tools, you're not going to know how to read it. So based on the special purpose map, what do you think the map's title is? Because if you notice, we, we don't have a title. I see that it's Asia, and I see that there's a key with these numbers. So I don't know, do these numbers mean average temperature in the springtime? Do these uh, numbers represent literacy rates? Actually, they represent life expectancy. And again, I created this using the World Bank. It's really important to look at also how special purpose maps were created so that you know that they're from trusted sources. So uh, we have the title, it is life expectancy. And the title gives the viewer an idea of what the map represents. Again, without this title, I could have this key and that's wonderful and lovely, but again, I don't really know specifically what I am analyzing. So that title is incredibly important. Now, equally important is the key or the legend. I could have the title. And again, I could make some educated guesses about what the color changes mean, but, I don't really know unless I have this key or a legend. It helps me interpret special purpose maps and physical maps. In a physical map, you're going to have a key that's going to change based on the elevation. So you know, oh, this place is 10,000 feet above sea level. Oh, this place is right at sea level. Oh my goodness, this place is below sea level. And then from that, you can analyze things. For example, based on the special purpose map, what's China's life expectancy? You can take the color and trace it down here and say, oh, it's over 75 and a half or over 74 and a half. And then ask more questions. Oh, well, China, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea. It looks like if you take East Asia, they have a general high life expectancy compared specifically to South Asia. But then you can look at these outliers, North Korea and Mongolia, and ask, well, why are North Korea and Mongolia these outliers in East Asia? And then you can say, oh, okay, well, look, North Korea, you can, if you know a little bit about its politics, and Kim Jong-un, uh, you can maybe analyze why that life expectancy is lower. If you look at a physical map with the special purpose map, you'll notice, oh, well, there's actually a huge desert here. Mongolia is landlocked. Um, it's a high desert, so it's incredibly cold and it's incredibly dry and it uh, is, is harder to grow things. And that's going to, this really isolated politically because of its physical geography and that might contribute to its life expectancy. So a next, another helpful tool that you might want when reading a map is a compass. And this shows these four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Now you do have these four cardinal directions. You can see east and west here, and you can see north and south. But something that is also incredibly helpful is if you couple two directions together, this is northwest. Or you could say this is north of this and then west of this. We don't use the terms right, left, or on top of, or below of um, in geography. We use north, south, east, and west. Another helpful tool is a scale. So in order to understand the size, you need to understand scale. This shows distance on a map versus real distance, right? If I am walking, um, someplace and I want to walk for 10 minutes and I look at a map and I say on my phone because uh, it's not uh, 1995 
I might want to look at a scale uh, on the map on my phone to determine, okay, well, how, how many blocks is this? Uh, how long will this take? Um, oh, this is three miles? Oh, I see. On the map, it looks like it's a lot more. On the map, it looks like it's a lot less. So again, we have to shrink maps. And so since we're shrinking maps, um, depending on how we shrink it, it's going to reveal the distance on the map versus the real distance. And there is some math in geography. One thing I like though about math and geography is that numbers don't lie, right? This map is in a different language. It's not in English, but I can still look at the scale and see that one centimeter on this map is going to equal six kilometers or this distance here is going to equal 50 kilometers. Now, going back to this concept of scale and size, why do some maps look different? Maps turn the Earth's globe into a flat surface. We have this globe here and we have to get it flat. So how do we do that? The process requires the cartographer or the map maker to transform the latitudes and longitudes in order to have a flat plane. So again, we're gonna take this globe here and we are going to turn it into this flat plane. So take something that's 3D and turn it into 2D. So depending on the projection you're viewing, land might appear larger or smaller than it actually is. For example, if you take the Mercator projection, the Mercator projection turns the globe into a cylinder first, and then it flattens it out. So we have this globe, we have it turned into a cylinder, and then we have it turned onto this flat plane. Now, it's really good for navigation. Historically, you're looking at these navigators traveling in ships across the globe, tra uh, trading with each other, and they're not spending too much time down here or too much time up here because it's icy and it's frozen. Instead, they're spending most of their time down here. So the Mercator projection is good for navigation, but it increases land distortion at the poles. So if a country is really this size, when you flatten out that map and stretch it, it is going to widen the countries at the poles. And you can see this with the truesize.com that says, quote, that the Mercator map exaggerates the size of countries near the poles like US, Russia, Europe, and downplaying the size near the equator. So in reality, Greenland is 8.8 .8 million square miles and Africa is 11.6 million square miles, nearly 14 times and a half larger. But again, if you look at this Mercator projection, Greenland appears huge and Africa is big, but it's smaller than Greenland, according to the Mercator map. So let's see what this actually looks like in practice. So we can start with the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is right there in the middle on the equator. Now, if we move it further north, you see how it increases in size? We take Russia and we move it further south and you see how it decreases in size. And that's because, again, you're flattening the map out at the poles. You take Greenland, and it appears to be the exact same size as the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but the Mercator projection exaggerates its size. There you see Canada. It's a large country, but again, it's not as large as it appears. Even if you take the United States of America, it's a large country, specifically when you take in consideration Alaska, but you bring it near the equator and you can see its true size compared to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So let's look at some other options we have for looking at maps, because again, not all maps are the same. We don't just use the Mercator projection. There's also the Peters projection, and this represents countries in their true proportion to one another, which is good for navigation because again, it has this rectangle shape and it's flattened out the earth so it shows size but again you have land being distorted when it comes to shape so something that represents a little bit of a more accurate representation would be the winkle triple projection and this doesn't have the globe incredibly flattened you see flat on all four uh, sides here instead this doesn't try to flatten too much at the poles. 
So this minimizes distortion in area, direction, and distance, but it doesn't represent that 100% um, rectangle plane. And, but you can see here, again, land is distorted. If I can focus on Greenland and you can look at the size and shape of Greenland here versus the shape of Greenland here, the size is distorted in this one and the size and shape is a little bit more accurate in the Winkle triple. So let's review the poles and then the Earth's grid system, kind of bring this all together. The Earth is organized in a grid system. The grid system is basically a whole set of imaginary lines that reveal distance and give exact location. So I can pinpoint how far I am from the prime meridian in the eastern hemisphere or in the western hemisphere using lines of longitude and how far north or how far south I am compared to the equator. Sorry, the equator would be more like that. And so with this grid system, we're using those four cardinal directions that we just covered. Uh, and those four cardinal directions are what separate the hemispheres. So there's four hemispheres, despite the fact that Heming is, is two. We have four because we have these two up here, the north and then the south. And then we have these two here, the western hemisphere and the eastern hemisphere. So first let's talk about the Northern Hemisphere right here on top. We got the Southern Hemisphere right here on bottom and they are separated by this imaginary, go back here, by this imaginary line right in the middle. And this imaginary line is called the equator. So Northern and Southern Hemisphere are divided by the equator. And this equator is an imaginary line of latitude that is measured at zero degrees and it runs east and west. So again, here we get some more map terms. Runs east and west means it travels in this direction. These lines of latitude are also known as parallels because this line here We'll never touch this line here. And there's all of these imaginary lines in between, but we can't have every line of latitude and longitude marked on the map because then everything would just be 100% just covered in lines. So these lines of latitude never touch each other. So they run east and west, but they measure north and south. And that's because we got this fancy equator right here in the middle. And this equator is the most important line of latitude. Everything is measured against it. It's like the best sibling in the family or that cousin that went to Yale and Harvard Law and is the next president in the United States. Everything is measured against that. So they run parallel, they never touch, they measure distance north and south of the equator and they are zero to 90 degrees north here and zero to 90 degrees south. So you'll never find a line of latitude that is past the number 90. Let's talk about these other two hemispheres. We got the Western hemisphere and the Eastern hemisphere. And together they are split and they have a line running down the middle. And that line running down the middle is known as the prime meridian and the prime meridian is the most important line of longitude and just like the equator it's measured at zero zero degrees and it runs north and south again runs means it travels north and south between these poles now these touch at the poles there we go. So at the poles, all of these lines of longitude touch. Uh, they generally also reveal time zones, and I'll show you what that means on the next slide. So these lines touch, they run north and south, but they measure distance east and west of the equator. And as far as what lines they cover, zero to 180 degrees west and zero to 180 degrees east. And that's because if you take 
180 and 180 and you add them together, you are going to get 360 degrees. And there you go, you got a sphere, you got a globe. So time zones, uh, you can look at this map of time zones and see here also compare, you see these lines of longitude running across and you can see the time zone lines. So lines of longitude because of the earth and because of the earth sun relationship reveals different time zones. So the sun is going to rise uh, in the east, it's gonna set in the west, rise in the east and set in the west. Now, these time zone lines aren't perfect, right? We have this little outlier here and this outlier here, and this is a funky line, and like this is a really funky line. And that's because we have to care about this Earth-Sun relationship with the Earth rising and setting, but we also have to take in consideration political borders and political boundaries. It would be very odd if you had half of France in one time zone and the other half of France in another time zone, or England or the United Kingdom in one time zone, and then you know the other part of the United Kingdom in a different time zone. So let's examine this. Um, instead of talking about time zones with lines of longitude, let's transition to climate zones with lines of latitude. So we have the tropics, and the tropics are measured at 23 and a half degrees north here and 23 and a half degrees south. And again, what line are they always measured against? They're always measured against the equator right here. So the tropic in the north is the Tropic of Cancer. And this is measured at 23 and a half degrees north. And in the south, we have the Tropic of Capricorn. And this is measured at 23 and a half degrees south. So before I was showing you some numbers that really made sense, right? We have zero to 90 plus zero to 90, that equals 180, which is half of a circle. We have 180 plus 180, which is 360, which is the circumference of a circle. So why do we have 23 and a half? degrees. That's random. Except for the fact that the earth tilts. It's not straight up and down, right? Whoops, this. It's not straight up and down. The earth tilts on its axis at 23 and a half degrees. And the axis is between these north and south poles. And because it's tilted on this axis, that affects the amount of sunlight that the earth receives and it divides the earth into different climate regions. You have the low latitudes, which would be the tropics, the middle latitudes, and then the high latitudes, and the high latitudes would be the polar regions. And the low, middle, and high indicate the numbers. So low would be low numbers, middle, middle numbers, and high would be the high numbers. So let's dive into this a little bit more detailed. So you have this axis. The earth is tilted on this axis at 23 and a half degrees. So basically if you have you know the North Pole, the space between here would be 23 and a half degrees. So the low latitudes, these are the tropics, zero to 23 and a half degrees. It's hot, it's humid, you get direct rays of the sun year round, you have no clear seasons. Uh, you might have pants, uh, you might have a light jacket, but you're not gonna wear them too often. For the most part, this is like shorts and sandals type of weather. The next would be the middle latitudes, 23 and a half degrees to 66 and a half. And again, that would be north and south. And this is moderate temperature. If you're closer to the 23 and a half number, it's going to be warmer year round. But the closer you get to the 66 and a half degree number, the colder it's going to be. So if you're at like a 25 degree latitude, you might have temperatures ranging from, you know, 65 to 85. Um, and it might be 65 or 70 in the winter. And it might be, um, you know, uh, fairly hot in the summer. Um, but if you get to the 66 and a half degrees in the middle latitudes, you could get zero degrees in the winter and you could get 70 degrees in the summer. So you're going to have something that ranges from the fairly hot to the fairly cold and you should have clear seasons. Again, if you're closer to here, 
it's going to have extreme cold and if you're in the winter time and if you're here you're going to have a lot hotter summers so let's look at these polar regions this is the 66 and a half to 90 degrees north and south and this is going to be a very cold year round it could be january it could be june it could be july it could be march you're going to wear a jacket all of the time and depending on what pool you're located in, you could have endless daylight or endless night. And that's because the sun's rays are going to hit at a slant. So here you can see how the South Pole is tilted away from the sun's rays. And while it's tilted away from the sun's rays, even when it spins, even when it rotates, this South Pole is still not gonna be tilted towards the sun's rays. So in the winter time, in the southern hemisphere you're going to have endless nighttime but the exact the opposite is true in the northern hemisphere so if it's summer in the northern hemisphere like it would be summer up here and it would be winter down here if it's summer you have the sun is directly over this uh, tropic of cancer right you can see this here and trace this line is directly over the tropic of cancer so the sun's rays are directly over that line it doesn't have to travel really far so you're going to feel extreme heat so up here you're gonna have endless daylight because no matter how this earth spins you're going to constantly have this sunlight here because the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun so you're going to have the endless daylight, but the sun's rays have to travel so far here, not travel far, here, travel so far. So you're going to get the endless sun, but again, not direct rays. So you're not going to feel the heat. So if you look at this globe spin just a little bit, you're going to see the equator is and the two tropics are right there in the middle and you're going to see the polar regions are right there um, on either end so let's talk about this you know rotation revolution i had been talking about so a rotation oops i have a video here there we go a rotation it takes the earth 24 hours to have a full rotation or a 360 degree spin now a revolution Sorry, it's 364 and a quarter, or 365 and a quarter days. I need to fix that, not a half. To have a full revolution around the sun. So I'll just kind of block that out. To have a full revolution around the sun. So a rotation, this is going to cause a day. A revolution is going to cause a year. Uh, and this is what brings out these different seasons that are going to change. And we're going to get to that next. So if we go back to that display with the Earth sitting on its axis at 23 and a half degrees, in this model, the sun is directly over the Tropic of Capricorn. So you can see that Northern Hemisphere is in the dark and the Southern Hemisphere is in the light. So you can see that it takes longer for the sun to bring its heat to the Southern Hemisphere. So you're gonna have the sun, but it's still going to be icy. So the solstice, let's talk about these seasons. The sun is directly over either tropic. So again, since it's directly over this tropic of Capricorn, you're going to have the longest day up here. You're gonna have the summer solstice down here in the Southern hemisphere, and you might have a 14 hour of daylight. You might have 20 hours of daylight, depends on where you are. If you're down here, you might have 24 hours of daylight. At the same time, in the tropic of Cancer, and in the Northern Hemisphere, you're gonna have the winter solstice. So you might have eight hours of daylight or you might have three hours of daylight or no hours of daylight. Now the equinox, this is when the sun, we moved it up here, would be shining directly over the equator. And if the sun is directly over the equator, you have an even amount of sunlight. So you're gonna have 12 hours of daylight to mark the fall equinox or 12 hours to mark the spring equinox. So I had just covered this. Which term applies to this diagram? You should be thinking solstice. It applies to the summer solstice in the uh, southern hemisphere and you got the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere. So let's review this again.
The sun is directly over the northern tropic. It's summer in the northern hemisphere. It's directly over the southern tropic. It is summer in the, in the southern hemisphere. So it's, again, because of this tilt that you see right here and right here, uh, and the revolution that causes these different season changes. So let's look up. Oh, I'm going to skip this video for right now. And let's kind of look at some real world examples. Cap Cancun, Mexico. So it's July. It's at 21 degrees north of the equator and you have 14 hours and four minutes of visible sunlight. And you can see the high and low, it's not very different. I mean, you're gonna have 77 and 90 degrees, but generally you're looking at you know, a 10 degree difference between a high and a low. Here, you just have seven degree difference. And that's because of its low latitude. We can go into Argentina and it's at 51 degrees south. So again, this is July. And you can notice that it is cooler temperatures. And that's because it is winter in the Southern Hemisphere in July. And you're looking at nine hours and 37 minutes of visible sunlight. If we go into Edinburgh, Scotland, we're looking at 55 degrees North. So it's going to be summer and you get 18 hours. So again, Edinburgh, Scotland, 18 hours. Um, and you're gonna look at Argentina, nine hours. They're basically in the 50s when it comes to latitude. But again, it's because they're in different hemispheres. Now, you might be asking, in Mexico, it's Northern Hemisphere, we have nice, warm temperatures across the board. Yay! But it's summer in the Northern Hemisphere in July. So why is it dramatically cooler, right? We have 59 degrees here, 61, 61, rainy, cloudy. Well. You have a few other factors that affect climate. Number one, elevation and landforms. Places of high elevation like mountain ranges can experience extreme cold. And wind and ocean currents. San Francisco is located at 37 degrees north, and it can be 60 degrees in the summer. Now you can have the Sacramento Valley uh, that is roughly at 37 degrees north as well, and it could be 100 degrees at the same time that it's 65 in San Francisco but that's because San Francisco has those wind and ocean currents that cool it down. And again, the Andes Mountains, it's gonna, it's gonna be freezing cold at the top of those peaks year round because you're looking at higher elevation. It's gonna be warmer in a valley as well. So if you look at these different landforms. So we just went and covered a ton of information, different types of maps, different tools on a maps, uh, different ways of reading maps, why map projections are different. We talked about the Earth-Sun relationship as well. So there's a lot going on here. So just making sure that you email me if you have any questions. Thank you so much, geographers, and have a great day.